Puerto Rico. I'm here at the Grafton Cable TV to do a special new program for you. It's going to be called Let's Try Something New. And I'm going to be showing you how to do a beginner colored pencil bookmark. This is what I hope will accomplish the top maple leaf this afternoon. So there's many things to do before we can kind of get started. You need to have a sketch of a maple leaf. Doesn't have to be just like mine, but if you can see mine, I have the maple leaf on the top. I have a bigger maple leaf that I was practicing to get ready for the show on the bottom. So I'm going to start working with you on this folded maple leaf on the top. But before we get to the maple leaf, I'm going to show you and talk a little bit about the basics of the pencils that I'm going to be using. I'm going to be using Prismacolor colored pencils. They're a wax base colored pencil. I hope you can see the yellow. And the wax base Prismacolor pencil is a translucent pencil. That means it's not opaque. And it's not transparent, but it's translucent. So the method we use to create our product is by layering one color on top of another to form another color. And we get beautiful luminosity when we do this. So I'm going to show you a few of the basic strokes to get started. I'm going to pick another color so you'll be able to see it better. The first thing we're going to practice is a stroke called a Brillo stroke, or Brillo pad. Those of you that are old enough know what a Brillo pad is. Some of you don't. And what it is, I'm going to do it larger. It's a circular stroke. And it looks really just like those old-fashioned Brillo pads. So that's a Brillo pad stroke, just kind of loosely. When we get working on areas, we like to do them usually smaller. So hard for you to see exactly the stroke that I'm doing. But it's usually used as a fill-in stroke or a blending stroke. So that's considered the Brillo pad. So if I say to you, I'm going to be filling this area in with a Brillo pad stroke, that's what I'm doing. Usually smaller, not usually larger. Better to do one coat than two light coats. Sometimes it works out OK, but you have to just kind of experiment as you get to know the medium. So besides the Brillo pad stroke, we'll put a big B here for Brillo pad, I'm going to do a linear stroke. And a linear stroke is just as it sounds. You're just going back and forth. You should really be working on the tip of your pencil. But because I'm standing and I'm holding up this piece, I tend to relax and work on the side of the pencil, which is really a bad habit to get into. You really shouldn't get into that habit. And if you're home, you're either going to be working flat or with your piece maybe adjusted three or four inches up, which will make it easier on you to work on. So as I'm doing this, I've kind of done kind of a medium pressure. You also need to think about knowing which strokes we might be using. You might use a crosshatch stroke. But very rarely do we use that. I'm going to be using different pressures. And pressures are very important because this is a wax base pencil. I'm going to start out using my Brillo pad in a linear manner. And I'm going to use light pressure. So I'm coming down light pressure. And I'm going to get heavier pressure. And then really heavy pressure. So I'm sure you can see the difference. Now you saw me just turn my pencil because I needed a better point on my pencil. Sometimes when we're working on a piece of paper, I'm going to backtrack just a minute. This is a matte board that I'm working on. And it has a very nice, tight finish. I might be working on a piece of Mitens paper which has a slight texture to it. It's almost like working on an English muffin. And the reason I say you need to have a nice point, as you're doing your Brillo pad stroke, 
you want your sharp point to be working down into the depressions of the paper instead of just skirting on the top. So to back up for a second, it's always important to have a good pencil sharpener. You might say, oh, any pencil sharpener is fine. Some people have a little different thought on the pencil sharpener. I'll tell you mine. You always want to keep a nice point on your pencil. And I say to my students, I want to hear you using that pencil sharpener at least every minute to keep that nice, sharp point. Because the better the point, the better your work is going to be, the easier it's going to be to outline an area. So I like to keep my pencil nice and sharp. Some people like to use the handheld sharpeners. I learned by using these. And you might say, oh, what's the big deal about a sharpener? Well, if you have a sharpener that you're using, and it's grinding off the wax off your pencil, you're going to have these great big hunks of shavings in here. And that's what you do not want, because all your pencil is going into the pencil sharpener. So the pencil sharpener is one of your very important friends to have a good pencil sharpener. And you'll see, as I'm working on this design, that I'll continually stop and I'll sharpen my pencil. Sometimes kind of a grating thing, but it's something that I have to do. So those are the basic strokes that you kind of need to think about as we move along on this little journey. I also like to say to people, I happen to be left hand, Handed. So if I was working at home, I would have tissue paper, tracing paper, something under my hand, because the oil from my hand will probably put a smudge on your paper, keep you from blending just right, because you've got an oily residue. So if you can remember, try to have something underneath your hand as you're working. It can be a paper towel, whatever you happen to have handy. So back to the design that I have for today, the folded maple leaf. Um, you can see I brought a couple with me. And actually, you know, they could be most anything. But the design that I've done today, I've tried to incorporate about six pencils, so it would be an inexpensive learning project for you. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to take my color called Canary Yellow. I have a decent point on it. I've blown this up a little bit, hoping that you could see it better. And I'm going to start filling it in, which I'll do as quickly as possible. I'm not looking for perfection here. I'm just looking for you to understand and see what I'm doing. I mean, because it's going to be boring just watching me fill this in. So I probably will do larger Brillo pad strokes just because I want to fill it in quickly. Sometimes it's nice. Unfortunately, you see my pencil line. If I was doing this at home, I wouldn't have it that dark. I've just turned my pencil around to get another pointed side. And I'm going to try to do this as quickly as I can. And I'm going to be layering these colors as I work, mainly on this project from light to dark. And as we get along, going along, I'll show you a couple of tricks. Now, I could probably stop right now and um, sharpen my pencil, but I'm going to just kind of keep going. The bad thing is, being left-handed, it's probably a little hard for you to see exactly what I'm doing. So I'm going to do this leaf, this flipped leaf, one section at a time. Laying down, mainly I'm doing the Brillo pad stroke, sometimes working linearly, but just trying to get one coat on here. Not too heavy, not too light, because I know I'm going to put at least two to three more coats on this. So I don't want to build it up too heavy, or it's going to get too waxy. Now that I had mentioned that, you could maybe take your paper towel or your tissue. And if you get really waxy, sometimes you can take and really rub the surface 
and get a little of that waxy finish off. I don't find that works well for me, but other people have been successful doing that. As I move to the left, underneath the flip, I'm going to make a darker value. And I've taken out a pe pencil now called goldenrod. So I'm going to start kind of underneath the flip. And I think I'll have to turn this way. I'm going to be underneath the flip applying the goldenrod. Again, I'm still using the Brillo pad stroke. As I come out, I'm going to lighten up on my pressure. I may come all the way to the edge, but I want to be lifting up on the pressure so the color gets lighter. I'm going to add more pressure as I come up. You, you can probably see the difference in the value. I hate to have my head down, but let's see if we can stand kind of like this. It would be great if you were following along with me, because then I wouldn't feel that I had to go faster to keep you interested in what I'm doing. Because obviously, just watching me do little Brillo pad strokes isn't the most interesting thing. Don't worry about that. Some of this will be cut out. Oh, OK. <laughs> Some of it's uh, starting to draw over into this. OK, great. So I've kind of got it under the flip. And now I'm going to work it out lightly over the yellow area. Could I leave the yellow just as is? Sure. I mean, you have so much latitude in what you might want to do. But this is just kind of you know, a step by step to get you started to let you know that there are a lot of options on how you handle this. You can probably see some of my leaves I have brought here. And every leaf is different than every other leaf. Now you can see I'm kind of getting little streaks here. So I'm going to change my direction. So if I was working east to west, I might turn and start working north to south. Because my goal is to get a nice, even coat darker underneath the flip, lighter as I move out to the right-hand edge. And I'm not going to take time to be too perfect on the edges, because I'm going to add some other colors here. Maybe I won't add this color up on the top. All right, so let's, I've kind of created a little bit of a line here. I'm going to soften it a little bit. OK, so let's, let's say there I've kind of got the first two coats on. I've got canary yellow, and I've got goldenrod. And you can see the difference in the colors. So I'm trying to go from light to dark. Now I'm going to try to add a little bit of interest, and I'm going to grab some of my poppy red. It's going to kind of look like an orangey color, but it's called poppy red. So I'm going to start and kind of outline it. This is where I'm going to place it. So I'm going to outline it, because OK, that's where I'm going to do this. So I'm going to work off my outline. I might have made that a little dark. Let's see how it's going to work out. So I'm going to try to soften it out into the goldenrod, into the yellow. Depending on the paper, you'll start to see it look more blended. Sometimes you have to go back, because from where I'm standing, I can see all these little kind of like crevices, like I was talking about the English muffin. All right, one thing you don't ever want to do, if you can help it, is let the viewer see where I've stopped. 
So I have to come, I, maybe I have to turn it. I like my students when they're learning a project to have whatever paper, mat board, whatever they're using attached to a plexiglass backboard because they don't have to have their grubby hands all over their project and it helps them turn it in different directions. All right, so now I'm trying to add really light pressure of this color. But then I'm going to have to go back to try to work out the little bit of a problem I'm getting here. So I started out pretty nice over here, pretty heavy. I lightened up on my pressure. But now I feel that I'm going to have to go back either with my golden rod or maybe my canary yellow to work out these edges. Or maybe I'm going to have to go all the way back and put more yellow on. That's going to help out a little bit. So these, like I said, these are the choices that I made. But let's say you already had a set of colors and you didn't happen to have a couple of these. You could fill anything you know, in, as long as you think about the value. Because we're going to go dark, darker here and try to keep it lighter over on this edge. All right, so that's looking a little better. But I think I'm going to go back up here. I'm going to put some more yellow in here with more pressure. And now maybe I'll go back in with a little bit more orange. But just because I want the orange to work good, it's not. You can see I was working on a sample before I came over here and doing a much better job than I am now. But that's OK. And I think I'm going to leave that up there. And I'm going to come in here. I'm going to make this a little bit stronger, a little more interesting. Maybe flip it upside down. It's looking better. The more you get on there, the better it looks. And if you happen to be working on a particular paper and you're not happy sometimes what's, what's going on, they have blending tools. All right, so I'm going to work my way down in a minute. And I'll show you what a blending tool can, can do. So I'm going to, I've grabbed a couple of blending tools. This wasn't in the supply list. These are called Tatians. There's a large one and a small one. And you can use these as blenders. When you blend with them, they blend the colors together, breaking down the pigment without adding more wax. So sometimes, like I told you, you can get this thing called the wax bloom you might choose to use one of these tortillas. I think I'm saying that correctly. And again, I would still be using that Brillo pad stroke. And it's pushing the color now into those little valleys. And I'm going to hold this so, so you can see it. You can see just a little bit, and I'll point it out, where I'm doing this. It's giving me, on this particular paper at this particular area a much better, softer look that I like. 
All right, so I'll point that out. You can see that I've used the tatian here as compared to here. And I have added no more color, but I've got a nice, soft effect. So these things come in very handy. And if you get into this hobby, you'll find that you can keep adding more and more things to it. So I'm going to keep working. Um, I think I'm going to stop and just show you something a little different. We have our main stem coming in. And I haven't gotten too far along down here. Maybe it'll show up. Maybe it won't. We'll see. I'm just going to say there's a vein. This is called a stylus. I'm going to place a vein, and I'm going to put it in with pressure here. Now, I could have done it before I put that first coat on. So we'll see how that's going to work out. This is kind of one of those tricks to the trade. So I'm going to add a little more goldenrod down here, and then we're going to start um, adding some other colors over to start shading. And I'll show you what, uh, what happened where I put the stylus. So I don't know if you can see this, but right here where I made the little vein for the stylus, it left a groove in the paper. And so now, as I'm working my pencil, I'm jumping over that spot, and it will leave um, a light area. I think we'll go back just to the practice, just for a second, because this is really something that is very handy to do. You take your stylus. Let's say I was doing a cat, and it had whiskers. So before I got going, I would take, and I would actually score the paper with my stylus. And then when I was working the cat, I would have preserved my whiskers. So you can see that the stylus is a handy tool for doing veins, whiskers, all kinds of different things. So like I say, just another trick. All right, let's move on. And even though this up here doesn't look great, you can see this is what I was striving for right here, a nice, smooth blend. Some people are OK with this, but I really like a nice blend. So I'm going to add a little bit of mineral orange. OK, it's a nice subdued orange color. I'm going to put a little bit up here. Not too far away from that golden rod. And I can tell by me holding this on the side, it's not my friend today. Better, like I say, if I hold it up, even though I'm sorry my hand is right in front of it, it certainly works better. Too bad I didn't have people asking me questions as we were doing this, because it would make it more interesting. All right, let's say I'm reasonably happy with what I've done so far. So I've introduced canary we started with, moved on to a goldenrod, added some of this beautiful poppy. Now I'm adding mineral orange, which needs more work. And now I'm going to go underneath my flip here. And I'm going to start darkening it, up, darkening it up with a color called burnt okra. So it's a nice color. It's a dark brown, oh, semi-dark brown. And so I'm going to come in here with a little more pressure. And as I work out, I'm going to lighten up on my pressure. Because I want to say to the viewer, there's a shadow underneath where the leaf is folded over.
And like anything, like I say, you need to have value change. So I'm striving to get it the darkest next to the flip and it lighting, lightening up as it moves away. So I'm lessening my pressure. So again, a, a reasonable job. Not great, but you can see what I'm trying to say to you. Now I'm going to take another pencil, just a little bit darker, and I'm going to go in and strengthen the dark a little bit more. So this is my burnt sienna or sienna brown. I get my colors confused because in oil paints it would be called burnt sienna. In pencils, it's sienna brown. I don't know, I'll let you look at that for a minute. This isn't really great here. You shouldn't see where I've stopped, but I can go back. I'm going to put a little darker in here so you can see this other color. Not too good for a left-handed down there, so I'll come back up here. Now I'm starting to get waxy in here because now I've got yellow under there. I've got goldenrod under there. I just put my burnt okra, and now I'm adding some sienna brown. So I can feel it getting waxy. Doesn't seem too bad down and through here. Doesn't seem to be too good up here on the top. So I'm going to see if we can make this a little bit better. So I'm going to grab my other pencil, my little lighter brown. See if I can go back. Break the lighter value brown in here. I may even choose to add a little red up in here. See if I can solve this problem that I happen to have going. Well, that's already better right there. The bad thing is, for some people, they say it hurts their hand. But if you try this and it hurts your hand, the more you do it, uh, it goes away. Your hand gets used to doing it. Um, maybe people with arthritis would say, oh, no, they don't get used to it. But you will. I mean, I can sit and do this all day long without it bothering me. I'm going to add a little bit of orange in here just to kind of try to pull it together. Throw some orange down here, maybe a little bit. As you can see, there's no quite perfect place for me to hold this. And I, I chose to come down here a little bit so you can see just a little bit more where I use the stylus and put that vein in. All right, so you can see what I've done. Uh, I'll just go over it. I started with the canary. I added the goldenrod. We added poppy here. Uh, in my original picture, I added poppy here, which I may or may not do. I started my shading with my burnt okra, and then I went to my sienna brown, which I put here and here, but have not added there. Uh, I'm going to try to darken this area a little bit more here, just so we can do that without ruining the value. And so maybe you can, oh, there you go. You can see the vein popping out a little bit more. And there seems to be another line in the paper, so I either scratched the paper somehow before. OK, and I, now I could go back and I could take my tatian. I could probably work it better in here, make it more interesting. Uh, but we'll just take a break for a minute and so you can do kind of look at it and see what you think. OK, well, now we're going to continue along a little bit. 
uh, I've given you a pretty good idea of how the basic part of the lead is going to look. You're going to finish the other half here, same steps. We're going to, and I'm going to kind of quickly go through them, just so you'll get them into your head, you'll understand it. But it's a progression of light to dark. So we're going to start in again, and I'm just going to do this little piece up here. We'll start again with our canary yellow. With our Brillo pad stroke, but pulling it down in a linear manner. So after I get the yellow under there, then I'm going to move on to my darker color, and I'm going to go to the goldenrod. So I'm going to turn it upside down because it's easier for me. I'm going to start from the outside edge, which has to stay darker, and it needs to get lighter as it comes towards the main part of the leaf. Because, you know, as it flips over, that's the way it's going to be. It's going to roll to the back. It's going to be a little darker in the back. You can make it as light or dark as you want. I know we haven't used the green this week, but we'll use the green next week. All right, so now that's a little darker. Um, I think it would look better if I move on. I could even throw a little orange in there. Um, let's pick up the mineral orange, add a little mineral orange to it just for interest. Again, I'm always doing that Brillo pad stroke. Starting off heavier, lightening up on my pressure for it to make this look like it's kind of connected as it comes around. And then you could go to one of your brown shades to make it just a little bit darker. But you have to be careful. So as you can see, I've added that little bit of interest on the brown, on the turn of the leaves. So I'm thinking about always keeping this front edge lighter and the back edge darker. So I'm sure you'll have no problem finishing this. Uh, we may even come back to next week talking a little bit more about veins, because the veins will maybe be more important on next week's class because you can see the vein is a very important piece to the oak leaf. So go out, find your oak leaves, and I hope I see you next week. I'm Bonnie Frederico from the Seller Shop here at the Grafton Cable TV channel. I hope you've enjoyed this segment of our lesson.